So first of all, thank you so much for that word. Thank you all. And um, I want to make sure that before we leave this space that we have a word of prayer mm. for South Sudan. Yes. Okay? And, and before we get started, in your pews, you're going to see these little blue scribble pads. The church, yes, and the church didn't say that we could do this, but um, <laughs> if you have a question for uh, Reverend Stalling um, Lewis, if you would write your question down in a legible form, <laughs> I'd be more than glad to share it uh, if we have time. And so I'm thinking let's take a good 10 to 12 minutes and just uh, answer a couple questions. Sounds like a I plan. I got some. I got a couple here, but okay. I'll start with one here that says, um, is there a particular theme that you have emphasized as you visit presbyteries and congregations throughout the country? Yeah, so I think two. One is the Unbounded We Thrive, because we genuinely were seeing that in our work just on the places we were finding ourselves previously and being able to articulate, hey, this is something we're seeing in the sense of um, connecting with each other, offering space for us to celebrate that we have the ability to be a part of, such as we're coming out of this COVID time, to, come, to be a part of the wakening up and the reawakening of our communities. I know there is a sense of anxiety for a lot of spaces, but there also is this amazing opportunity before us if we, if we allow ourselves to be free enough to, to embrace it. The other is Matthew 25. Um, that passage that is the core is so powerful because it deeply connects the humanity of Christ with the humanity of those in our midst. And it moves our way of being from, you know, as Presbyterians, uh, we've been known to get stuck in this brain of ours. Um, we've been known to, to, to think things deeply, but to not give it space to move through our bodies. And so um, both of those are, are ways in which I think they in, invoke and reflect an embodied theology that I, I think we're, we're, we're also just waking up, right? It feels like post-COVID or post the lockdown portion of COVID, we were so disembodied. We were so in our own spaces that there's a joy in just celebrating the ways that we can actually be be in a thriving relationship with our communities, in, even in a world that can feel so in opposition to that at times. You know, as you talk about Matthew 25, mm -hmm. and I imagine the, the church reaching out into mm -hmm. its community, mm -hmm. at the very same time, we have these internal institutional challenges, mm -hmm. like the recent resignation of mm -hmm. our mm -hmm. uh, stated clerk. Mm -hmm. And the question is, do you anticipate any major changes or changes in emphasis and mission or focus of the PCUSA behind that resignation? Oh, that's a great question. I, I, I don't only because I think we're in this unique place. Um, first of all, Reverend um, J. Herbert Nelson uh, has laid some amazing foundations in his time and his tenure, and he has um, left the space when he is stepping away in June, um, ready for the next chapter. Uh, many of you may know that the Office of the General Assembly and the Presbyterian Mission Agency, there was a commission that was created, um, was, well, yeah, created, uh, given the green light uh, during the General Assembly, and both Ruth and I helped to staff that particular committee, that commission. And to be clear, it's a commission, so it's got like a wide area of leadership when it comes to imagining a new entity um, that fulfills the responsibilities of Presbyterian Mission Agency and OGA, but also is a new thing that we need now. Um, and so in some ways, there's a gift um, uh, of imagining what is possible that doesn't leave me believing that we will be stymied in any way, um, particularly because Dr. Nelson was faithful in his leadership. Uh, and so I think any time a person leaves a space faithfully, there is a gift of um, the next chapter being even more faithful because we kind of build on those who've come before us, right? Like our whole book of confession leans into that space of there are saints who have come behind us and they did the best in their context to help us prepare for the seasons that we're in now. So I, I'm, I'm, yeah. Any questions out there? So, so um, one of the things that, 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 speaking of the pandemic that has mm -hmm. happened is this polarization mm -hmm. in our country. Um, 
polarization in our churches, churches. Mm -hmm. uh, we say we are the world. Mm -hmm. And so we experience the we same. We are the children. No, that's a different one. Okay. Uh, it's the same, same concept. <laughs> same concept. Except we don't get a Coke. Uh, um, aww, so, womp womp. Uh, oh, that's a Pepsi. I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's okay. Trace All right. Abounds. So the main thing is that, you know, we're dealing with this time of polarization, mm -hmm. not just along uh, political lines, mm -hmm. um, but it's affecting us theologically. Mm -hmm. It's affecting us, you know, there's this, this word, you know, you don't preach politics in the church. And, mm. and, and you know, if we're fighting, mm -hmm. struggling over at that time. Remember mask? Mass Ooh, became a yeah. political thing, oh, yeah. right? The red, the blue divide, and yeah. sometimes it was divided right down the middle of the aisle. True. Um, what can you say, or how can a Peace USA help to reestablish a more civil, loving, and caring uh, uh, society in this broken world? And this, I do not offer flippantly, but we genuinely must reach out and actually love each other. Like, it cannot mm. be fake. I think one of the things we've, we have lived into, unfortunately, in the world is that we are very, con like, we're very polite. We were very polite for a long time. Even if we genuinely did not, um, we just weren't honest, right? And I think in some ways there's just been a revelation of what was, and that doesn't make it easier. But in some ways, there's the potential for us to develop a better capacity for genuine diversity of opinions if we genuinely love each other. Will you reach out to that person who gets on your left nerve? Or will you say, forget them? Because it's that discarding thing that I don't, it, when we discard the person, when we, convince, when we conflate an issue with a personhood, and we make them an enemy, that's where there's no room for love. There's no room for seeing each other. And that I think, even if we are, ve I have people who have completely different views on really important things to me, but I try to center their humanity. And I think as Presbyterians, we can continue to practice that. We can actually say, you know, you said something earlier that I have to tell you, it's like nails on a chalkboard to me. I hate the phrase frozen chosen. Oh mm -hmm. my God, it, it mm -hmm. rends my soul. Mm -hmm. It rends my soul because I do think, you know, life and death there is in the power of the tongue. And we have called ourselves that for a long time. And we have made cold hearts for ourselves in a lot of spaces. And it may be that we're just thawing out. Um, and that feel, you know, like when your relationship and your family, when everyone starts to tell the truth, it gets a little awkward before it gets better, doesn't it? Or maybe just my family. Okay, maybe it's just me. Um, so it could be that we're actually in the process of healing, but it, t it would take the faith to genuinely say more than anything, though, Greg, I'm going to love you, even if you feel very different than me. And I think that's the thing. We can, we can practice it. We can be awkward about it. We can live into it. I like to say, you know, if only we could remember what we learned in Sunday school. Uh, then, Sharing is caring. Yep, mm -hmm. yep. Um, well, they have some really tough questions here. So are you think you're ready for I'm, this? I'm going to give it All right. Uh, how do we bring about world peace? Ooh. No, that's not the question. That, that would be my question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in 2004, the Peace USA took a stand in favor of the concept of reparations. Mm -hmm. Do you see Matthew 25 as a re-engagement on this on this topic nationally and locally. Mm, okay, so let me see. Yeah. I thought that word I might think they are, yeah. and so I am not sure, I'll be honest, I don't know exactly which, um, which issue we're naming from 2004, so sure. I don't have that in front of me. Sure. But I do think there is a continued conversation on what healed relationship looks like in a lot of ways. And I, I do believe that Matthew 25 in the desire to have embodied communities and to allow people to figure out what that looks like, whether it is the vital congregation work of saying, we are going to be alive. We're gonna have worship that is reflective of our communities. We're gonna you know, in, engage in ways that actually are human to human. So if you've uh, looked at the marks of vital, um, the marks of congregational vitality, they're, they're 
their wonderful kind of gifts that says, you know, we're going to move away from a, a staunch piety that is kind of uh, disembodied to something that's real and authentic. So um, I think in some ways there's a, a, a healing and any time, and this is Anytime there is a made wholeness, I think a returning to shalom, a, a returning to what's, what makes for a more flourishing world, it is a reparative thing. It is repairing the breach. And therefore, there is a reparation process, and it does have an investment of time and energy and resources in order to repair the thing. That I'm a big fan of the... Um, the akara, the akara phrase, siwo we we fenawo sankofa yanki, which means, in some people see the sankofa phrase, it's a, 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 a Ghanaian, um, uh, a Ghanaian, um, uh, a Dinkra symbol, but it means it's, uh, it's not an anathema to go back to get that which has been forgotten. It's not only right, it is faithful to fix the things that are broken. And I think in our language as Presbyterians, we name the reformed and always being reformed because there's always things that we, we say in our confessions. There are things that we've done that we shouldn't do and there are things we left undone that we should. So there's this invitation to fix what's broken and it's faithful. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you raise congregational vitality and um, that is uh, one of the three pieces of Matthew 25. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And congregational vitality is often defined by our denomination mm -hmm. as it's around discipleship, mm -hmm. it's around building mm -hmm. community and making mm -hmm. connections. And, mm -hmm. and, but the questions from the audience are around, you know, where's, where do we connect the whole issue of membership and membership decline? And, mm. and you know, how are, what is the thinking around that uh, for you and your office? Yeah, so there is um, one of the marks, I know, and I'm, I'm not going to get the language precisely, but it does talk about the fact that it's not about the numbers, it is about the faithfulness to the mission of the church, right? And so you can be a vital congregation at any size, and you can be a huge conversation that is not vital to its community. No offense. No offense. That never happens in Chicago Presbyterian. Oh, no. Uh, that's never, ever in the past ever happened. Um, but so size has far less to do than the intentionality and the impact to be authentically a blessing to the people that God has sent you to. It's more about how do you live into who God has called you to be in a way that actually brings about the kingdom now, not in that great beyond thing that we used to do. I mean, some people still do it, but I don't do it so much anymore. Like it's both and, now and not yet. Well, this is going to be the last question okay. because we want to uh, have yes. uh, communion. Yeah, that's what we want to the dinner. That's what we really want. But You're anyway, right. um, what is the most significant action you think that came out of the 225th General Assembly? Oof. Just let me rephrase it. Go ahead. The things we did, what energizes you? What, Oof. What makes you yeah. This um, I think, and this is not a cheat, I hope not, but actually doing the, doing the assembly in the way that we had mm. to figure out how to do hybrid. We had to figure out how to allow for folks to discern in community. We had to do the stuff of being the church on the national level and then hold the, the, and hold ourselves accountable to the same work that is happening in our congregations. I think there was so much learning that happened for our institution when the people that, you know, are, are part of the national church have to feel the same squeeze that the, the, the congregations were experiencing. I think there's something that, that mentality, I've seen it, even as we, I mentioned we're gonna have a, um, we have moderators conferences, uh-oh, sorry. Um, but we can take some of those learnings and I think it does create better abilities to have more impactful work as the church at large. There's been great conversations around decentralizing some of the work that traditionally has happened in the building in Louisville. Um, I think that was actually the gift, is that we were forced to be faithful, and we call, uh, Ruth and I use the language, the bold and faithful commissioners and advisory delegates of the two, because folks were working their, t I mean, it, was an, it was a marathon. I don't know, are there any commissioners or advisory delegates? Come on now, that's right. Yeah, I just wanna clap it up for you. Because um, it, it was intense, but it was faithful and there was an honesty for which things happened um, because people really gave of their time and energy to show up for in quarantine. It was just wild. Mm 